Justin will talk about Harvey simplification and the approximate degree of constant depth circuits. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so this is joint work with Mark Bunn, who's a graduate student at Harvard. Uh, I'll actually be, des be describing results from um, two papers we've had in the last year, uh, and it's the second paper, which I'll get to in the latter part of the talk, uh, that yields the title. Um, so I'll start with some standard notation. So throughout this talk, uh, f will denote a Boolean function, mapping minus 1, 1 to the n to minus 1, 1, and we'll associate minus 1 with logical true and plus 1 with logical false. So for example, the n function uh, will evaluate to minus 1 if all of its inputs are equal to minus 1, and will evaluate to plus 1 otherwise. Uh, so this talk will be about uh, a certain measure of the complexity of a Boolean function known as approximate degree. Um, so uh, this quantity is defined as follows. Uh, so a real polynomial P is said to epsilon approximate a Boolean function F if uh, P of X minus F of X uh, is bounded in absolute value by epsilon for all points X in the Boolean hypercube. So this is the worst case notion of approximation. P has to be accurate, a good approximation for F at every single point in the Boolean hypercube. Uh, now, the uh, epsilon approximate degree of f, uh, denoted uh, as follows right here, uh, is the minimum degree needed to epsilon approximate f. Uh, and if we don't actually specify epsilon, then by convention we take epsilon equal to one-third, and we just refer to the approximate degree of f. Uh, so we could actually replace one-third with any uh, constant strictly less than one, and it wouldn't change the theory in any way. It's chosen by convention. Uh, so hopefully you saw that definition and you immediately uh, recognized that this was a very natural measure of the complexity of a Boolean function and worthy of study. But if you uh, disagree with that, there are some other reasons to care about it as well. Uh, for example, uh, upper bounds on approximate degree immediately yield efficient learning algorithms. And in fact, underlie many of the fastest known learning algorithms uh, in a wide variety of scenarios. Um, and at a high level, uh, the more stringent or challenging the learning environment, the tighter we need the approximations to be. So in some learning scenarios, epsilon, the error parameter, can be arbitrarily close to 1. And in others, uh, more challenging scenarios, we need epsilon to be a constant strictly less than 1. Uh, other applications uh, uh, of lower bounds on approximate degree are as follows. Uh, lower bounds on approximate degree immediately yield lower bounds on quantum query complexity, communication complexity, and circuit complexity. Uh, I'll draw your attention in particular to the circuit complexity bullet point. Um, you'll notice that a lot of these references are only a few years old. So dual formulations of approximate degree that we're going to see at length in this talk have, in the last several years, been used to resolve several long-standing open questions in communication complexity. And we'll see uh, one or two of these applications in the talk. Uh, we also won't get to some. Um, OK, so uh, now that you care about approximate degree, I want to uh, quickly run through a uh, relatively simple example uh, just to familiarize ourselves with the concept. Uh, I'll explain um, or I'll characterize the approximate degree of the n function. Uh, which has been known now for 20 years uh, since the seminal work of Nissan and Segedi. Um, so the approximate degree of the n function is root n, uh, and the upper bound uh, makes use of uh, the Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, so this is a uh, extremal, and it's an extremely useful extremal family of polynomials, and let me motivate why they come up in this setting as follows. Uh, so Marco's inequality from approximation theory, uh, not to be confused with Marco's inequality from probability theory, uh, says the following. Uh, so let G be a univariate polynomial of degree at most D, uh, and assume that um, at all points in the unit interval T, uh, the absolute value of G is bounded by 1. So G is bounded in the unit interval. Markov's inequality states that the derivative at G at all points in the unit interval is itself bounded by at most the square of the degree. And in fact, the Chebyshev polynomials are, extract, are exactly extremal for Markov's inequality. So I've drawn here the Chebyshev polynomial of degree 16. And what you can see is that um, you know, it has these very large derivatives, this big jump right at the endpoints of the unit interval. And in the interior of the interval, it's sort of oscillating as quickly as it can around 0. Um, and Marcus inequality says that no degree 16 polynomial can have a bigger jump if it stays bounded in the unit interval, a bigger derivative. So why is this useful for approximating the n function? Um, so by shifting and scaling um, this Chebyshev polynomial, we can achieve a polynomial that looks like this. So what I've done is I've, I've shifted the polynomial so that it has a big jump right around minus 1. So uh, at the input minus 1, it takes value right about minus 1. And then it jumps very quickly up to plus 1. And it sort of hovers around there for the rest of the unit interval. And intuitively, this is what, kind of what we want to approximate the n function. Because the n function evaluates to minus 1 on a single input, the input of maximal Hamming weight, and evaluates to plus 1 everywhere else. And in fact, if we apply this univariate polynomial, which I'll call q, to the Hamming weight of an n-dimensional you know, Boolean input, uh, this will, in fact, be an approximation to the n function. And we only need degree root n because we need this derivative to be n, roughly proportional to n. And we can do that with Chebyshev polynomials of degree root n. 
So that's why the root n comes in the upper bound. Uh, let's, at a high level, uh, talk about the lower bound argument of Nissan and Segebi. Um, so this argument uses a technique called symmetrization, um, and this technique works as follows. So suppose we had an n-variate approximation to the n-function, call it p. Um, what symmetrization does is it turns this n-variate polynomial into a univariate polynomial, I'll call it p-sim, uh, and argues that the univariate polynomial has to look like this. So this is exactly the picture we had on the previous slide. So I'll hide the details of how we exactly go from P to P-sim, but we argue that it has to look like this. And moreover, we argue that this map is uh, non, sorry, degree non-increasing. That is, the degree of P-sim is at most the degree of P. Um, so therefore, if P-sim had high degree, so does P as well. And Marcos inequality says that because P-sim has a large jump uh, right here and stays bounded in the whole unit interval, uh, that P-sim must have large degree. It must have degree at least root n. Uh, and therefore, P does as well, and that's the lower bound. Um, okay, so that's, uh, symmetrization was the primary technique we had for proving approximate degree lower bounds for many years, um, and this talk will focus on techniques for going beyond symmetrization. So intuitively, uh, symmetrization, while very powerful, uh, has its limitations. It appears to be uh, a lossy technique. So in turning an n-variate polynomial P into a univariate polynomial P sim, we have to throw away a lot of information about P. Right, we're taking this very high dimensional object, this n-variate polynomial, and turn it into, turning it into a univariate one. We, we have to be throwing away some information. Um, so in the case of symmetric functions, we still have enough information around to prove tight lower bounds. But for non-symmetric functions, uh, we really seem to run into a barrier here. And there was a uh, long-standing, well, relatively long-standing um, challenge problem uh, to resolve the approximate degree of a function known as the two-level or ends tree. Um, so this was a challenge problem because it was the simplest function that symmetrization seemed to break down for. So in the OR entry, uh, it's, it, the function is simply a read once DNF. So that is, it's a depth two Boolean circuit. And for simplicity, I'll assume it's balanced. So every single gate in the circuit has fan in root n. Uh, and for notational convenience, I'll call the input to the ith end gate x sub i. So each x sub i has uh, root n variables uh, within x sub i, and there are root n of the x sub i's. Any questions about this function? OK. So uh, here's a brief history of progress on resolving the approximate degree of this function. So in 2003, Hoyer, Hoyer Moskva, and DeWolf proved an upper bound of root n. Um, now, progress on lower bounds was incremental, spanning many years. So Nissan and Segedi's fundamental result about the n function immediately yields a lower bound of n to the 1 fourth. The reason being that if you look at just a single n gate within this function, that itself has approximate degree at least n to the 1 fourth. Um, now, progress proceeded sort of uh, in fits and jumps. In 2008, Aronson reposed the question during a Fox tutorial, again, because the problem seemed to uh, capture the limitations of symmetrization. And earlier this year, uh, Mark and I proved uh, a matching lower bound of n to the 1 half. And Shurstov, around the same time, independently achieved the same result. Um, so I'll start by telling you how we achieved this result. Um, so the high-level technique that we use is to use a linear programming formulation of approximate degree. And we certainly did not introduce this technique. It has been used in several prior works um, dating back several years. Um, so this technique works as follows. So we can ask, uh, fix a Boolean function f, what is the best error achievable by any degree d approximation to f? Uh, so the answer to this question is actually the value of a linear program. So the, the, the uh, variables in this LP are the error parameter epsilon and the coefficients of our degree d polynomial p. And the program simply says minimize the error parameter epsilon subject to the constraints that p actually be an epsilon approximation for f. Uh, so this is not a linear program in standard form, but standard manipulations can turn it into one. And you can take the dual of this LP. And um, don't stare too hard at this quite yet, but I've written the dual up here. And the point is that uh, if you exhibit a good solution to the dual LP, uh, that gives a lower bound on the value of the primal, which says that any de uh, degree d approximation to f has to have high error. So giving good dual solutions uh, to the dual LP is equivalent to proving approximate degree lower bounds. Uh, so that's the, the approach that we take. Uh, and let's look at this dual in more detail. So uh, strong duality says that, uh, I should, I guess, I'll mention, um, this technique is completely lossless in the sense that strong duality says that whatever the right answer is, whatever the approximate degree of f is, there is a dual witness that will exhibit it. So all we have to do is construct it. We haven't thrown away the game at the start. Um, OK, so what does a dual witness look like? Um, so a dual witness is just a function um, on the Boolean hypercube. It's real valued. And I'm going to refer to it as a dual polynomial for reasons that will hopefully become clear. 
Um, so the first property that a dual witness has to satisfy is its correlation with f must be at least epsilon. Um, so actually, the correlation of the dual polynomial with f is the objective value of the dual. Um, so you need that to be larger than epsilon to prove an epsilon approximate degree lower bound. That says that any degree d polynomial has to have error at least epsilon. Um, the first constraint of the dual LP says that the L1 norm of psi, the dual polynomial, has to be exactly 1. That's just a normalization constraint. So I'll actually ignore it through the whole talk and just assume that all of our dual polynomials are normalized to have L1 norm 1. Um, the final set of constraints says that uh, psi has to have exactly zero correlation with every polynomial of degree at most d. Uh, equivalently, uh, psi, all of the low degree Fourier coefficients of psi have to be zero. So if you write psi out as a polynomial, it has no low degree terms. Um, so I'll refer to this as having pure high degree d. So intuitively, uh, what psi is, it's capturing it, the part of f that is of pure high degree that is completely missed by low degree polynomials. So if this part of f is significant in the sense that it's well correlated with f, then any degree d approximation has to have large error. Um, and this, this dual formulation has proved essential in, um, in several prior works. Um, and our goal now is to construct an explicit dual polynomial for the OR entry. Um, so a very natural approach to this problem is the following. So uh, by Nissan and Segedi's fundamental result, we know that the approximate degree of OR and END on END of the one-half variables is END of the one-fourth for each of them. So there is a dual polynomial for each of these functions exhibiting this fact. So I'm going to call these psi out and psi in. Okay, so the question is, like, our goal is to get a dual polynomial for the block co composed function OR composed with END. The question is, can we combine psi out and psi in to get a dual polynomial for this block composed function? Um, so here's a first attempt at doing this, and it won't work, but it will sort of fail in an instructive way. Um, so the primal function we're trying to uh, argue about is the block composition of OR with END. So it's very natural to just block compose dual witnesses, see what happens. Um, so we need to prove two things if this is going to be a good dual witness. We need to show that it has pure high degree at least end of the one half, and we need to show that it has good correlation with the OR entry. Um, so it actually does have the pure high degree that we want. Um, and this is really a trivial fact. Uh, I'll see if I can sketch it right now. Uh, all it's saying is that if you take a polynomial with no low degree terms, and you block compose it with another polynomial with no low degree terms, and you just expand everything out and collect everything, then the degree of the resulting terms will blow up multiplicatively. Um, so a little more concretely, if one of the terms for psi out, let's say the only term was um, the product of two variables, and similarly for psi in, when you just block compose them, then each variable in psi out turns into two variables um, from the inner polynomial, and same with uh, the other variable appearing in psi out, and what you get is the product of four variables. Okay, so anyway, this is a straw man anyway, so if that didn't quite make sense, that's okay. Um, the important point here is it's actually the correlation analysis that doesn't work. Uh, and intuitively, the correlation analysis fails for the following reason. So we have control over the values that psi out takes on Boolean inputs, right? We know psi out by being a dual witness for the OR function, has good correlation with OR on Boolean inputs, but we're not feeding Boolean inputs into psi out here. We're feeding real values into psi out because psi in is a real valued function. Okay, so we have no control over the combined dual witnesses' values, and uh, in fact, this, this fails bad, badly. Um, so what do we do? Um, so we actually did not introduce uh, what we do. Uh, this was introduced in prior work by Shurstev and Lee. Uh, and what, what we do is uh, essentially the simplest thing you could want to do if you want to force Boolean values to be fed into psi out. Okay, what we do is we feed the sine of psi in into psi out. Uh, now, we still need to take into account the magnitude of psi in in some way. So we do that in the simplest way possible. Uh, we simply multiply by all of the magnitudes sort of outside the composition. Um, okay, now it's not clear at all that this composed polynomial, this combined dual witness, satisfies either of the conditions we need it to, either pure high degreeness or uh, good correlation with or end. But it turns out it does satisfy both. Um, so the first condition was actually established in prior work that introduced this combining technique, um, and it's the high correlation analysis that was the contribution of, of the new work. Um, so uh, even though uh, Shurstev uh, analyzed uh, the pure high degree-ness uh, of the composed dual witness, I want to give some intuition for why this fact holds. Uh, so I'll do that very quickly. Um, so for intuition, consider um, a psi out that takes three inputs and ignores the, the, the third input, and just outputs the product of the first two. So this has pure high degree two. 
All right, so then if you just look at what this equation for the combined dual witness, what you get is, um, right, so you replace y1 with sine of x1, uh, sine of psi in of x1, and similarly for y2. So you get a sine term for each of the variables actually appearing in psi out. And then you get the magnitudes uh, outside the composition. Okay, and now for each of the variables that do have a sine term, each of the blocks that do have a sine term, we can combine it with their magnitudes to just get psi in back out. Uh, so what we have here is we have a product of several, uh, whatever the pure high degreeness of psi out is, we get that many copies of psi in. And then we get a whole bunch of magnitudes that we don't have any information about and we just essentially ignore. Okay, these don't hurt us, our pure high degreeness, because we're over, uh, they're over disjoint variables than the other blocks, but they don't help us either. Um, the point is that if you multiply a whole bunch of uh, polynomials, each with no low degree terms, then once again, uh, if you collect terms, the pure high degreeness behaves multiplicatively. Um, so maybe, maybe this isn't coming across completely, but uh, is, is the high level picture roughly clear? Are there any questions about this? <laughs> Right, so um, what you, the way you should think of it is, um, right, so let's imagine that this was just, uh, you know, the product of, you know, several variables from the first block, this is the product of several variables from the second block, and this is just something involving variables from the third block. Um, you know, this something might have degree one, it might have degree a million, it doesn't matter. It's, all, it's just different variables. Um, it's still the case that when you just write out like the, the Fourier expression of this thing, everything with a non-zero uh, coefficient will involve a lot of variables from the first two blocks. That's what's happening. Any other questions? Okay, so let's go to the correlation analysis where I'm going to wave my hands even more. Um, so uh, the idea here is the following. What we want to do is we want to show that the combined dual witness has good correlation with the composed target function. And the way we do that is we show that this correlation is approximately equivalent to the correlation of the outer dual witness with the outer target function, or. Uh, and the intuition for why this approximate equality should hold is the following. So we are feeding a uh, sine of psi in of all of the blocks into the outer dual witness, right? And uh, the point is that psi in is correlated with the inner function, right? That was one of the properties that any dual witness for the inner function had to satisfy. As a result, uh, sine of psi in is a decent predictor for the inner function, okay? So uh, normally, if you look at like an average case input to the inner function, right, sine of psi in will actually agree exactly with the inner function. Uh, but there are errors. Uh, so all we need to do is we need to show the errors don't build up in some sense. And to make this uh, intuition a little more precise, I'll point out that if, if psi in was actually perfectly correlated with the inner function, then this approximate equality would hold with exact equality. Uh, so we're really just trying to show that errors don't build up in some sense. Um, okay, so that's the main point that I wanted to get across. Now I'm going to try to convey the details, but it's going to be a little more challenging. So um, again, our goal is to show that the correlation of the combined dual witness with the combined function is approximately equal to the correlation of the outer dual witness with the outer function, and the analysis proceeds in two cases. So let's denote the vector of values we're actually feeding into the outer dual witness by y. Okay, so the first case considers a y that is not equal to the all false vector. So that is, we're actually feeding some coordinate, some true coordinate into the outer dual witness. Um, now the point is that uh, we only need to trust this single true coordinate, we only need to make sure that coordinate is error free to force the value of the combined function to evaluate to true, actually evaluate to true on this input. What's happening here is that the OR function evaluates to true if even a single input is set to true. So if the outer dual witness thinks one of its inputs is true, all you have to do is believe that single input. And, uh, and then you know, the outer dual witness is really sort of believing the right thing. That's the intuition for what's happening. So formally, we're using the fact that the certificate complexity of OR on one of these inputs is one. All right, so errors do not build up there. Um, the other case is to consider y equal to the all false vector. So here we're really in trouble because we really need to trust that all of these coordinates are error free. All right, if, even, if even a single of these things that the outer dual witness believes is false is actually true, then you change the value of or and uh, you're really in trouble. So fortunately, the inner dual witness has a special one-sided error property that I recognize is coming out of nowhere right now. I'll explain in a minute. But this inner dual witness satisfies the following property. If sine of the inner dual witness evaluated of any input is one, 
then in fact uh, the n function evaluated on that same input is guaranteed to equal one. There is no error in this case. Uh, and, and we're done. That completes the correlation analysis. Um, so in summary, and again I will explain why this one-sided error property holds in just a minute. In summary, the correlation analysis proceeds in two cases. So in the first case, we're feeding at least one true uh, one true coordinate into the outer dual witness, and errors did not build up because we only needed to trust that single true value. In the second case, uh, all of the values we fed into were false. We needed to trust all of them, but we could because of this one-sided error property. Any questions about that much of the proof? Okay, so let's talk about this one-sided error property. Um, all right, so I need to introduce a uh, newish variant of approximate degree, uh, which uh, we call one-sided approximate degree. So a real polynomial P is said to be a one-sided epsilon approximation for a Boolean function F if uh, the following two conditions are satisfied. So for inputs in F inverse of 1, we insist that the approximation be a true epsilon approximation. All right? It has error at most, one, uh, sorry, at most epsilon relative to F. But for inputs in F inverse of minus 1, we only require a threshold condition on P. We only require that P be smaller than minus 1. Okay, so this is actually... Um, the one-sided approximate degree of any Boolean function is always at most the approximate degree, but it could be much smaller. Um, so similarly to approximate degree, we let the one-sided approximate degree to error epsilon be the minimum degree of a one-sided epsilon approximation. And if we don't specify epsilon, just assume it's one-third. Um, so where did this come from? Uh, so if you write the natural linear program capturing one-sided approximate degree, and you take its dual, what you get out is exactly the approximate degree dual with an extra set of constraints. This extra set of constraints says that the dual witness has to be non-positive on all inputs in F inverse of minus 1. So put another way, uh, if this dual witness outputs something positive, then you know that the input must be in F inverse of 1. That's exactly the property we needed for the proof to go through. All right, so I've completely you know, sort of convinced you that our proof holds as long as I can argue that the, the one-sided approximate degree of the n function is root n. That is the same as its approximate degree. Uh, so let me explain at an intuitive level why this should be the case. Um, so if we, uh, well, in the case of approximate degree, I argued that the lower bound held because we could take any approximate, approximating polynomial for the n function and symmetrize it into a polynomial that looked like this. So it would have a big jump right around minus 1, and then it would stay bounded for the rest of the unit interval. Now, if we replace the approximate condition with a threshold condition on the input uh, you know, f inverse of minus 1, all we do is make the jump bigger. And Markov's inequality still applies. And that's it. So that's the intuitive reason why the one-sided approximate degree is high. It's actually even easier to see. We have explicit dual witnesses for the n function, and they have one-sided error. But this is the uh, reason that is maybe more, uh, you know, intuitive to people who are a little bit familiar with approximate degree. Um, okay, so that completes uh, the first part of the talk. Any, any questions at this point? Okay, so I'll get to hardness amplification um, for constant depth circuits in particular. Um, so our goal here is the following. Um, suppose we're given uh, a quote-unquote simple Boolean function f that is hard to approximate to low error by degree d polynomials. Uh, can we turn f into a still simple function, capital F, that is hard to approximate even to high error. So we're asking, can we somehow um, take little f and turn it into a much harder function that's still simple in some way? And the answer we give is yes, uh, in the following quantitative sense. So let f be any function with high uh, one-sided approximate degree, so one-sided approximate degree at least d. Uh, and consider uh, the or of t disjoint copies of f. Okay, then the one-sided approximate degree of this combined function is also at least d. But this is, holds even if we allow the error to be exponentially close to 1. So capital F is much harder to approximate. Um, and a very important point here is that if F was a constant depth circuit, then so is capital F. OK, so let's just jump into the proof of this theorem. So we've already done a lot of the conceptual work uh, in sort of explaining how the proof will go. So just like before, we're going to take a uh, dual witness for the inner function, which in this case is an arbitrary function, uh, F with high one-sided approximate degree. And we're going to you know, let this dual witness actually witness the high one-sided approximate degree of the inner function. We're going to use a very different outer dual witness in this case. So this outer dual witness uh, will evaluate to 1 half on the all false input, minus 1 half on the all true input, and it will just ignore everyone else, just evaluate to 0. And we're going to combine these dual witnesses exactly as before to t obtain a dual witness for the uh, composed function capital F. 
And we just have to verify that this combined to witness has a uh, pure high degree at least D and correlation at least 1 minus 2 to the minus T with capital F. Um, so let's do that. Let's start with the pure high degree calculation, uh, which is we've already essentially done. So notice that uh, psi out is balanced. Um, so that is it has expected value 0. Right? It took value uh, 1 half on a single input, took value minus 1 half on another, and ignored everything else. So it's a balanced function. And that's just another way of saying it has pure high degree 1. Okay, so we, we already argued that when we combine dual witnesses in, in the way of the manner of Schurstev and Lee, uh, then the pure high degreeness grows multiplicatively. So in this case, we get out 1 times d, which is just d. So that was easy. Um, so the meat of the analysis is in the, the correlation analysis. And uh, yeah, let me l try to give the intuition for this again. So we're going to try to do the same thing. We're going to try to show that the combined dual witness, uh, its correlation with f is roughly uh, equal to um, the outer dual witness's correlation with or. Uh, now the, this approximate equality has to hold like very tightly. right? The gap has to be at most 2 to the minus t. Um, note that uh, the outer dual witness actually had perfect correlation with or. So this, if we prove this, we actually do get the desired 1 minus 2 to the minus t correlation. Um, so the analysis, once again, proceeds in two cases based on what we're feeding into the outer dual witness. Uh, here, it's naturally only two cases because the outer dual witness only pays attention to two vectors. All right, so the first case is the all true input. We're feeding the all true input into the outer dual witness. Um, so in this case, if even a single coordinate uh, of this vector y is error free, um, then uh, we're happy. That is, the OR function evaluates to, what, to true if even a single one of its inputs is true. And here we're feeding in a whole bunch of trues. All of them are true. So we only have to trust one of them. All right, so now each coordinate we're feeding in makes an error with probability only one half because the inner dual witness is well correlated with f. And in fact, these errors happen independently. All right, there's actually a product distribution at play. I'm, I'm sort of hand-waving those details because this is a product. Um, so these errors happen independently. Um, and therefore, all of these are an error with probability only 2 to the minus t, since there's t of them. OK, so that case is done. And, and the other case we already handled. In the other case, we're feeding in the all-false vector. In this case, we have to trust all of these coordinates, but we can because we assume that the inner dual witness has one-sided error. That's the correlation. Any questions about? this uh, hand wavy proof. OK. Um, all right, so our ultimate goal is to apply our hardness amplification techniques to functions in AC0, functions computed by constant depth circuits, in order to get very hard functions that are still in AC0. Uh, so to do this, we need to prove a good one-sided approximate degree lower bound for AC0. Now, I already argued that the n function had one-sided approximate degree root n. And that's in AC0, so that's a start. Uh, can we do better? Uh, so we can, and what we use is called the element distinctness function. Uh, so the definition of this function isn't so important. We use it as a black box, but let me try to say what it is. So it interprets its n-bit input as a sequence of numbers. Uh, let's say n over log n numbers, each from a range of size roughly n. Uh, and it outputs true if and only if all of those numbers are distinct. That's what the function does. Uh, so Aronson and she showed in 2004, um, or at least that's the journal version, I think, uh, that the approximate degree of this function is at least roughly n to the 2 thirds. And in fact, this is a tight lower bound for this function. Um, so th their proof actually used a very intricate symmetrization argument. It's a remarkable argument. Uh, and this is the best known lower bound on the approximate degree of an AC0 function. Uh, so we show that, in fact, the one-sided approximate degree of this function is roughly n to the 2 thirds. And our pr proof proceeds as follows. So we use Aronson and Shea's lower bound as a black box. And what we do is we show how to take any dual witness to the approximate degree of the element distinctness function and turn it into a dual witness with one-sided error, just generically. Um, so it's interesting. Aronson and Shea's proof is, is really remarkable, and it argues only about the primal. right? It's actually do, using symmetrization and arguing about polynomial approximations. And our sort of extension or strengthening of their proof only uses the dual view um, and uses their, their result as a black box. Uh, I actually don't know how to prove this lower bound via the primal view. So um, that would be, I would be interested to see one. But anyway. Um, so this is not related to what you proved on the previous slide? Um, pre no. So all we're looking for here is, um, so we proved the theorem on the previous slide that amplifies hardness. And we're looking for a function to amplify the hardness of here. So any questions about the one-sided approximate degree lower bound for element distinctness? OK. 
Um, so by combining our hardness amplification result with our one-sided approximate degree lower bound for element distinctness, uh, we achieve the following theorem. So the parameters of this theorem, um, we actually achieve sort of smooth trade-offs between the error and uh, the degree lower bounds that we get out. Um, but I'm picking a particular point on the trade-off curve that is most important for applications. So what we get is a function in AC0 such that um, its one-sided approximate degree is n to the two-fifths or so, uh, even if you allow error one minus two to the uh, minus n to the two-fifths. Um, that's what comes out when you combine the hardness amplification result with the element distinctness lower bound. Um, so what is the depth for uh, element distinctness? Element distinctness is computed by a depth to CNF. So this or of a bunch of copies of element distinctness is computed by a depth three circuit. Um, right, so let's talk about applications. Uh, so now I have to talk about discrepancy. Um, I think Shakar uh, introduced it in the first talk of today. Uh, the definition is not so important, but I guess in a sentence, um, discrepancy captures the correlation of F with constant cost communication protocols, also known as combinatorial rectangles. Um, but here, here's the important point. Um, low discrepancy of a function implies that the function has high communication complexity in nearly every communication model. Uh, it also is a central quantity in learning theory uh, and circuit complexity. Um, and it was open for many years to prove an exponential, exponentially small discrepancy lower bound for AC0. Um, and that was resolved um, in 2007 and 2008 um, by Shurstov and Berman, Vereshagin, and DeWolf. And uh, we use Shurstov's techniques. So in Shurstov's 2008 paper on the pattern matrix method, he showed how to uh, take any function with high approximate degree and turn it into a related function uh, with, ex with low discrepancy. And uh, the transformation preserves membership in AC0. Um, right? it, add, it winds up adding one extra layer to the circuit. Um, and the actual bound on discrepancy that he gets out, ignoring some terms that are not consequential for us, is um, the maximum of 1 over w and 2 to the minus d. Where here, 1 over w is the distance of the error parameter from 1, and d is the degree of the lower bound. Um, so the lower bound, or it's an upper bound on discrepancy, is strongest when 1 over w equals 2 to the minus d. And that's exactly the parameter settings that I had set in the previous corollary. So what we get out is we get an AC0 function f computed by a depth 4 circuit, uh, because this transformation added an extra layer, uh, with discrepancy um, 2 to the minus n to the 2 fifths. All right, and this improves over the previous lower bounds of Shurstov, Berman, Vereshagin, and DeWolf, uh, which was 2 to the n to the 1 third. Um, we also get a number of immediate corollaries from this result. For example, we get a function in AC0 that is not computed by majority of threshold circuits of size 2 to the n of the 2 fifths. We get a new threshold weight lower bound for AC0. Uh, but I'm not going to go into details about this. Um, I guess I have time to cover the final result that I didn't think I would get to, um, which is back to OR entries. So um, earlier in the talk, we resolved the approximate degree of the OR entry of depth 2. But it remained open to uh, resolve, or we, nearly, we will nearly resolve it on this slide, um, the approximate degree of OR entries of higher depth. So um, let's let uh, OR end uh, D comma N denote the OR entry of depth D. So this is a uh, read once uh, Boolean circuit. Um, let's assume that it's, it's regular, so all gates have fan in N to the 1 over D. And let's stick an OR gate at the top. So all this is is a regular read once uh, depth D circuit. That's it. So to so I certainly know that the quantum query complexity had already been resolved. Yeah, but that's the same thing. Uh, no, so uh, not necessarily. Yeah, right. right. So approximate degree lower bounds quantum query complexity, but um, they're not necessarily equivalent. Okay. okay. So to, to the best of my knowledge, the best previous lower bound for depth 3 or greater was n to the 1 fourth plus 1 over 2d. Uh, and you actually only get the 1 over 2d if you use our depth 2 lower bound. <laughs> okay. 
So um, anyways, for depth three or greater, we prove the following lower bound. So we, we almost resolve it. So we get a lower bound of n to the 1 half modulo some logarithmic terms. And this matches an upper bound of n to the 1 half that follows from a, a recent result of Shurstov about making polynomials robust to noise. So you can essentially compose their approximations. Um, OK, so let me sketch at a very high level how we prove the lower bound. Um, so, and I'm going to look at the case only d equals 3. Um, so a first attempt uh, that's very natural is to view the or n tree of depth 3 as just or composed with the end or tree of depth 2. Right? So uh, we can let uh, psi out denote a dual polynomial uh, witnessing the high approximate degree of the or function, and we can let psi in denote a dual polynomial for the end or tree of depth 2 that uh, we essentially constructed at the start of the talk. That was for the or entry of depth 2, but it's, it's a trivial modification. And then we can try to combine the dual witnesses exactly as before in the manner of Shurstov and Lee. Um, and we just have to argue that this thing would have pure high degree end of the 1 half and good correlation with the target function. Now, the pure high degree calculation goes through just as before, but the correlation calculation is, again, the sticking point. And the problem is that the dual witness we had for depth 2 did not have one-sided error. All right, so the dual witness for depth 2 uh, sort of took an inner function with one-sided error, used that to argue high correlation of the composed dual witness, but did not preserve one-sided error. So this does not work. Uh, instead, what we do is we use a different dual polynomial for the inner function. Um, for, to get this polynomial, we use hardness amplification uh, to achieve the following. So while our inner dual witness will have error on both sides, uh, the error from the wrong side will be very small. And that's actually all we need. Uh, for the correlation analysis to go through, you know, hand-waving all the way. Um, so the hardness amplification step uh, loses us a factor of uh, root log n in the degree. We needed to kind of use some of the fan-in um, from the top gates in the, in the circuit to do hardness amplification rather than degree amplification, but uh, it's, only a, it's only a logarithmic factor. So that, that's what's going on there. Uh, okay, so in my last three minutes, um, I guess any, any questions about that final result? Okay, so in my last three minutes, I want to talk about some very exciting work by, uh, by Shurstov that is hot off the press. Maybe not, I don't even think it's off the press yet. Um, he did give us uh, permission to mention these results uh, during this talk. Um, so th these results are in threshold degree. Um, so this is defined as follows. Um, so let f uh, be a Boolean function. A polynomial p uh, sine represents f if the sine of p at all inputs x, Boolean inputs, uh, equals f of x. So the threshold degree of f is the minimum degree of a polynomial p that sine represents f. So this is equivalent to the approximate degree as the error parameter epsilon approaches 1. Okay. So in uh, 1968, in seminal work, Minsky and Papert proved an end of the one-third lower bound on the threshold degree of a specific DNF. Um, and that's been a very influential and important result um, in learning theory and, and elsewhere. And it's been open ever since to prove a lower bound of n to the one-third plus delta for any delta strictly greater than zero for any function in AC0. And the only progress we've seen in 45 years is a uh, polylogarithmic improvement by O'Donnell and Servetio from 2003. So we conjectured in, uh, in our hardness amplification paper that this function, um, you know, or composed with element distinctness that we use for our discrepancy bound, in fact, had threshold degree n to the two-fifths which would have been, uh, in fact, is the first polynomial improvement over Minsky and Papert. So uh, Sasha has proved our conjecture, and he has actually proved something um, much stronger, or stronger. Uh, he e exhibits a depth k circuit of polynomial size with threshold degree n to the k minus 1 over 2k minus 1. So as k grows for any constant k, this is always some constant strictly less than 1 half, but it's getting closer and closer to 1 half as k grows. Um, so in fact, uh, the proof of our conjecture, um, Shurstov's proof, is uh, roughly, it, it's a refinement of our techniques, and it's only about a page. However, this, this stronger result is, is much more technically involved with, with several uh, important new ideas. So uh, we're very excited to learn about this, and I wanted to close by mentioning that. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's root n. <laughs> uh, at least for constant d. What about, uh, Super constant d? Yeah, I'm not so. What, what is the end of the of depth log n? Right. So I know there is a lower bound. Um, I believe this is completely known. There, there's, so there's a, 
um, a lower bound of root n follows for that by reduction from parity. You can actually encode parity on root n variables in that. And I, I'm pretty sure that's tight, but I have to think about why it's tight, actually. Um, so, is a, so your technique, which, uh, you know, the way you explain the end of three, just the uh, root n, that's two. Uh, so you said we are composing uh, n with o, and mm -hmm. we use the approximate, uh, the dual polynomials of this. Mm -hmm. So just would it work well, but if you compose n with n? No. Uh, well, no, well. No, it will not. So I thought th about this a lot. So there's a conjecture that, um, right, uh, in general, for any, um, say, uh, G and F that are Boolean, there's a conjecture that uh, the approximate degree of uh, the block composition of G with F okay, is greater than or equal to the approximate degree of G times the approximate degree of F, uh, you know, modulo some constant factors. Right. So uh, what, what Shurstov showed that actually r gives the upper bound of root n for arbitrary constant depth is a converse to this. So he made polynomials robust to noise in a way that lets you combine their approximations. Um, now this question is still open, um, and you could think of our result for n or trees as just showing like another case, special case, where this conjecture is true. And um, my intuition is the following. So. Um, a function like end is one of the few cases that I have where like our techniques don't like clearly break down, and yet the conjecture is true anyway. So if you had a way to somehow unify the fact that end has approximate degree root n and the fact that the you know the end or tree works, then you might resolve this conjecture. But, yeah, but for you mean for the end or tree, like you know that the upper bound is square root of n because the quantum frame. <coughs> So does that does that hold for arbitrary depth, not even constant? So this holds for arbitrary. Okay, so there's there's one answer to your question. No, it's not an answer to this. So I was asking about the low bound. You were talking about okay. the okay, that. I thought you were asking because <laughs> I was asking about the low bound. Okay. The low bound, we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah, so, so yeah. you are right. Yeah. Right. That the quantum very complexity is completely known. Uh, is it believed that there is a bound of n to 1 minus delta for all a to 0 or something? Um, so I'm not sure that there's any consensus on that. That's, that's my belief. My belief is that the right answer is at least n to the 1 minus delta for any constant delta. But I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if there's a consensus on what the right answer is. So, so uh, sure, so these are, that's not going on the n to the half. It does not. And, should, and is it possible to go beyond that to the half? Or, I mean, I mean, it, 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 it is absolutely like an upper bound. Right. So, um, the, 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 I'm not sure I should be on record as speculating on this, but uh, maybe I will. I guess I will. So, um, I, I, I'll make the following conjecture. So, uh, this is a very, uh, yeah, I don't know. This is pure speculation. So, um, let f be any function uh, with one-sided approximate degree uh, d. All right, so I might conjecture that um, if you let sort of uh, nf denote the negation of f, and you block compose nf, say, k times, uh, I might conjecture that uh, this, as you, as k increases, the threshold degree of this function is approaching the one-sided approximate degree of f. Wait, what do you mean? Well, how, what is the composition? Right. So, What's the so, uh, so, so, block composition once will just be nf <coughs> composed with itself nf times, and I mean this to be regular. So, um, you know, like root n here, and each of these have fan n root n. So, um, and now I'm saying do it k times, block composed with k times. Um, and it's it, you know it's that this is my ridiculous speculation. Uh, so what, what was the conjecture? Right. Okay. So the conjecture is the following. So suppose uh, little f has one-sided approximate degree d. Okay. Um, the conjecture is look at the negation of f, and this is just done um, to ensure that uh, right. Like, or composed with or does not have high threshold degree, but or composed with n does. And that's just to get this kind of alternation in there, the negation of f. Um, now, so the k equals 2 version of my conjecture would be that the threshold degree of sort of nf composed with itself, uh, like root n copies of itself, um, each of 
fan in root n. Um, that would be like composing, block composing it once. And if you do it again, you would, you know, just keep doing this. And as you keep doing this, um, I think it's conceivable that the threshold degree is approaching the one-sided approximate degree of the original function. Um, right. So, what we right. So the the approximate degree of AC zero is still wide open as well, right? And um, there are some candidates for uh, functions, right? The quantum query complexity of AC zero is known to be n over log n. Um, that's a result of Beam and I believe his student. Um, and uh, however, no bound, lower bound for the approximate degree uh, better than n to the two thirds is known. Um, and that's you know an important question in my. I don't know what the answer is for this uh, linear. Uh, not to my knowledge. Well, I'm actually not familiar with the function, but um, you know it, it's. It's it was something that uh, you know Dirac's function has high sensitivity in one direction. Right. You want a function that with both. You know, sure. So there is there is. Um, and there is a depth three function. Right? right. Right. So there's so 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 there's a um, candidate function. So the function we know that has quantum query complexity. Uh, n over log n, okay, which is, um, it's the surjectivity function, okay, and, you know, it's a natural conjecture that this function, in fact, has, you know, n over log n approximate degree. And um, Aronson showed in a paper where he proved the generalized lineal Nissan conjecture false, that this function has, like, very high block sensitivity in, like, an average case sense. So it satisfies properties such as, you know, the ones you're mentioning, um, and is a very natural candidate for such a lower bound. Two thousand thirteen B. This indicates the two thousand thirteen A. Twice, or no, so two thousand thirteen A was um, when Shurstov independently resolved the approximate degree of the two-level Andor tree. That was that was Shurstov thirteen A. Okay, that's a good uh, way to end. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>